Hello, and welcome to another edition of The Incorrigible Mr. Zeppos. Unauthorized and explicit readings. The show is made possible by your support on my Patreon page and my day job. Special thanks to the love and support from my family. Let's get started. The subject of God is a touchy one for many people, understandably, because it's simultaneously a very private thing and also a very group identity public thing. It's a subject I've wrestled with my entire conscious life from the very first time it was ever introduced. As I'm sure many have tried or are trying, I put on the atheism hat really hard, for as hard as I could. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, so did the author of this book that I'm going to share Uh, some thoughts about with you tonight. Karen Armstrong's New York Times bestseller, A History of God. And I love this particular cover, the version I have. Um, I don't remember. I've had this for a really long time. I don't don't remember when I bought it. Uh, But it's just simple and eloquent. And it's got a great uh, subtitle. The 4,000 Year Quest of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, With three very simple and graphic icons. uh, Anyways, the cover's gorgeous. Karen Armstrong, to give you a brief bit of context, felt a strong calling at a young age to join a sisterhood, became a nun. And as she explains in her introduction and in various parts of her book, she struggled with her relationship to the dogma and the biblical content, which is considered source material, and the Let's say, I'm using my terms, not hers, the infrastructure of the church itself. And I want to drop in on page XIX. What is that? That's that's 19, page 19 of the introduction. Sorry, takes me a second to translate Roman numerals in my head. Uh, She's talking about having spent many years... Well, I'll just read from here. Despite my years as a nun, I do not believe that my experience of God is unusual. My ideas about God were formed in childhood and did not keep abreast of my growing knowledge of other disciplines. Okay, let's stop and discuss that for a minute. Let's be really real about religion and about faith and about the thing that which we call God. And I I use that phrase. I don't know that I coined it. But if I lifted it from somebody, I did it unconsciously, and I don't know whom. So forgive me if I don't mean to be caught in any plagiarism there. But um, the thing that we call God, or that which we call God, uh, I use that term because after many years of, of 
of believing and of not believing and of searching and searching and searching and of comparing. My personal journey that has brought me here to this moment sharing with you uh, unsolicited my thoughts on the most divisive single three-letter word in the history of the species. Um, it's because I I haven't ignored the subject and I haven't uh, just latched on to that which my parents believed and ran with it. I haven't, I've, I've deeply struggled and I have in all earnestness attempted to not believe. In fact, I currently sort of try to reject the use of the term too often. But I digress. This point that she makes, I think, is worth pairing if I may gain, if I may get metastructural on your asses, with the one in the previous episode. If you haven't heard Rediscovering Watts, wait for it. You'll get there, and it'll it, it'll rock. Um, I think his point is incredibly salient to what she just said. Okay. Moving on, uh, Karen Armstrong continues. I had revised simplistic childhood views of Father Christmas. I had come to a more mature understanding of the complexities of the human predicament than had been possible in kindergarten. Now, let's pause here for a minute. And and she's talking about our relationship inside our minds with two different things. The true nature of that which we are observing, that we call, we all commonly call reality, or the world, or the universe, or the cosmos, and her word based self narrative description, or to use some other term, idea, or to be bold and use another term, her own self constructed ideology about how she's interpreting that which she's observing, the thing that we call reality. Really contemplate that with what Alan Watts said in, in episode one. Uh, but I digress and continue. Yet my early confused ideas about God had not been modified or developed. People without my peculiarly religious background may also find that their notion of God was formed in infancy. Since those days we have put away childish things and have discarded the God of our years, of our first years. Let me pause here. For anybody who's a true believer, we're not talking about discarding God. Or even more clearly, we're not talking about discarding the whatever God is. We're talking about discarding our outdated or overly simplistic idea or model or construct of what God that that we which which we call God actually is. I'm going to read a little bit more, and then I have to stop to respect the um, the typical rules about over reading from books. And this is salient here. This, let's really sink in with this, folks. What she's about to say, I think, rocked my universe when I first read it in a way that. I'm yet to completely recover from. Yet my, because I read this book, and before I proceed, I want to interject. I've read this book in different ways and at different times of my life. The earliest, I think, might have been at the age of 11 or 12. In antis- No, a little bit later than that. It was right before I got to high school. Uh, in anticipation of uh, attending a private Catholic high school, at a time when I was sort of ambivalent about religion because it had basically just been something we did on Sundays that was excruciatingly boring and that for most of my youth, I didn't tune into the words or their meanings that were being said from the stage, but yet was fascinated by the theatricality. Um, I was lucky enough, I guess, um, to go to a very, uh, from my understanding very open-minded set of Catholic churches that were very on the edge of progressive, even for the time that I'm referring. 
Um, and they were also, uh, luckily, for my experience sake, relatively large congregations without reaching that level of super mega church, which is overwhelming, although it would have been excellent from a theater standpoint. But I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. That's a whole criticism of mega churches and how it's more, th- it's obviously more theater than even the most theatrical of shenanigans of church. But I, I don't want to jump ahead. I, my analysis of church is a separate episode, and I'm sure I've talked about it in other segments. Okay. So the following statement, like, wrecked me. I think each time that I've r- read it, uh, in terms of the three major times that I read this book, sort of rediscovering it each time, which is also true of uh, Mr. Watts's book. Okay. She continues. Yet my study of the history of religion, lowercase r, has revealed that human beings are spiritual animals. Indeed, there is a case for arguing that Homo sapiens is also Homo religiosos. Men or women, men and women started to worship gods as soon as they became recognizably human. They created religions at that same time as they created works of art. Okay. This is deep and profound. And it is something that our postmodern society very low-key but aggressively encourages everyone to ignore. Let's really unpack her sentence. The human being, which we're, we're going to accept that we're talking about God exists here. Um, although, like I was saying, I believe this author exists, you know, lived a few years of her life trying to be an atheist, as have I. So I'm not attending to disrespectfully make an argument against atheists. I'm trying to bridge that gap by saying, just like with science, the real thing that is God has no beef with atheists, uh, and atheists should be down with the real thing that is what we call God, because it is not the God that atheists are opposing. Um, and for real uh, history buffs, you'll know that most atheists today sort of seem to express a lack of familiarity with the fact that atheism is a contraction of anti-monotheism. Let that sink in. Anti-monotheism. Atheism is not, as it is commonly, currently expressed, a belief in the non-existence of God or an expression of a lack of belief in God or a divine thing or a higher spirit or a consciousness that operates all of the universe it is a rejection of another form of theist theory because let's be honest folks all of our religions are just theories because they are constructs of words trying and sometimes on purposely being led astray from an accurate description of the divine process which is much more complicated than any of our religions allow us to understand So, my atheist friends, if there are any of you trying to listen to this episode, trust that I speak to you with love and compassion and not trying to argue and say that you're wrong about anything. I am trying to let you know that you might not have a full context of what the... Just like America doesn't understand its founding fathers very well anymore, except for the real history buffs, um, and they have their disagreements, um, atheists have a lack of... like Their culture is sort of getting generic. And it's sort of just adopting an inaccurate generic rejection of God which you know we were just addressing in a way uh, and, and I'm trying to posit that what's really being rejected in atheism is the ideological construct of the personified God that the religions operate or peddle or sell or cram down our throats let us digress 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 May, human, humanity is an animal a part of nature an inseparable part of nature Uh, Curiously, not only does every individual human being share an incredibly high rate of similarity in genetic material, but so do we share pretty high percentages of genetic material identity, like the genetics is identical to other species. 
I know there's a bunch of conspiracy theories about genetic manipulation. We're not addressing that today. That's for a different segment. Karen Armstrong says that her life's history, life's research of religion has led her to believe that if even setting aside the major religions that exist today for the entirety of our uh, repetitive lives here on this womb that we unfortunately have convinced ourselves as a place have always been spiritual. Now, spirituality is defined differently than belief in religion, categorically. And let's be clear on that because many people, unfortunately, and for whatever reasons, either on purpose or through lack of comprehension or lack of familiarity, try to conflate them. And here I propose to you is my humble way of distinguishing them. Spirituality... Okay, let's put... I, I think I made a meme about this once because it's an image is coming to mind. Or maybe I'm supposed to make this meme now. But um, spirituality is a direct phenomenological and yes Bradley that's a real word I can read your mind I know you doubt that it's a real word you haven't bothered to look it up in the dictionary like I told you have you Mm -mm. spirituality (laughs) sorry that's a running gag forgive me Um, spirituality is a direct personal phenomenological communion with whatever divinity is and generally isn't all that interested in labels. Although throughout time and different cultures, spirituality systems have defined labels to try to grapple with the interesting infinite fractal layers of of the rest of reality that we currently don't have access to right now because of our own brainwashing. Religion, on the other hand, so spirituality is a direct experiencing in other words, to put it in less academic terms for everybody, is a, is a direct uh, being with that which is divine or an attempt to, a, a seeking of that, right? There's no, there's no, there should be no authoritative dictums made by anyone. Uh, a, a real guru is, is never your master and is never, uh, uh, should never be profiteering on you. A real guru is one who understands that he is you, in a different vessel and has some things to share with you. And as another adage goes, there's only one guru and one student and they are all you and you or you and me if it makes it easier to grasp. Religion, on the other hand, is a rigid, authoritative, top-down, legalistic control structure uh, with lots of cultural ritual and a lot, often, yes, good works and, and positive messaging and uh, great marketing that's, that's, that's warm and fuzzy, <laughs> uh, but a general uh, goal to dictate or require blind faith in an ideological construct as defined usually by committee by the, whoever is the wealthiest people who run the church. And that that dictate for blind faith is permanent, but that the content and the interpretation of the content is constantly at the whim of the egos who are collecting the money. I say this not because someone else told me, but because I, like Karen Armstrong in my own way, struggled with the questions that she brings up and did my own research. And I, I, I propose to you that in, in the simplest of terms, what I've just stated can be shown to be true and, and is very difficult to debunk. Obviously, there are examples of wonderful churches and synagogues and temples where there's no profiteering going on and people are really locally connected and the community is really helping the community and all that. And I'm not saying that that is not so. But at the organizational level and at each root of these mega organizations, there is profiteering, there is corruption, and there's all kinds of poor interpretation of whatever divine messaging was part of the originating impetus to form these structures. Whereas, you know, so when you join a religion, that religion tells you, this is what you need to believe, and don't question it much. 
Although if you do question it, we've got these awesome formulaic answers or whatever wild new things people who've already been brainwashed to blindly believe in this come up with. It's a self-perpetuating system and it is, by definition, ideology. Now I'm going to take it one step further, my friends. It is my thesis and proposal, I think original, or I'm not sure if others have said this in these exact terms. Maybe they have and I'm just being a horrible, horrible, uncreative um, renegade. But all, I posit to you, all ideology, regardless of how warm and fuzzy it might be able to, uh, uh, you know, inspire people to feel at times, all ideology is mental slavery. Spirituality, a genuine spirituality, mind you, lots of people dress up a religion as a spirituality. A true spirituality is unique and collaborative in the community uh, based on my observations in the in the real world in the field as it were and my research into other people's uh, research into organized religions and the histories thereof Karen Armstrong being just my favorite example out of many many that I've sat through in my life or sat through diligently read for the you know with burning passion um, because I wanted to find the best uh, of the best to try to make it all make sense. Spiritu- a true spirituality is as individual as it is collaborative with the community and it is about you as a member of that community communing with that within you which is by nature, by organic birthright, by the very const- by the not sorry, I don't want to conflate things, I don't want to use the word construct by the very f- way it works, by the actuality of it, by the reality of it, not someone's idea of it, a part of an expression of a manifestation of the divine thing or mind. As one person put it, all is mind. They don't mean your silly little identified, personified, attached to your avatar, attached to your wallet, wearing your khaki pants, driving your Mustang mind. That's just a tool that you're using. What I love about Karen Armstrong's book is that she's very sincere in expressing her search and and and, and, ex- and sharing with you the beauty of the three religions that she explores. The true beauty of the spiritualities that inspired the religious organizations. Um, I propose to you that there is a much neglected, much forgotten, much ill-practiced or not practiced at all Christian spirituality. Many people are doing it. I'm not saying no one is. But in terms of you go to any average general Joe Schmo church, um, it, especially, you know, especially in the more conservative, more uptight, more money-oriented types of uh, places, because there are whole swaths of everyone's separating poor are getting poorer over here the rich are getting richer over here everybody's praying to Jesus and nobody's doing what Jesus taught that exact same thing that exact same critique can be laid at all the religions no offense to my uh, Muslim friends no offense to my no offense meant to my Jewish friends there are of course in each and every religion that exists out there beautiful examples of wonderful people who either get it and are on an actual spiritual path using the particular roadmap provided by that particular um, spirituality that became a religion. But most are not, sadly. Which is why you see Christians killing Christians. Never mind, you know, everybody killing others of other religions. You know, you see Muslims killing Muslims. Buddhists killing Buddhists for fuck's sake. There's an ancient saying, I think it's in Watts' book, and we'll probably come across it in a future episode, but uh, my paraphrasing of it is, is, is don't eat the menu. You're supposed to eat the food, yo. That's, that's me putting it in postmodern terms, in urban terms. Because uh, I'm an urban person that who's uh, English is a second language to me and I learn from uh, Encyclopedia Britannica (laughs) anyways 
returning to the beautiful words of Karen Armstrong and finishing the point, digressing a bit. Um, oh, 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 I want to comment on the fact that she ends that last sentence with art. We have been spiritual animals and artist animals since before we could write sentences, since before we bothered to come up with words, and that's sort of really important. Many people can just go, so? So what? But there's a profound importance to that fact, which I think you'll understand, if, if you, especially once you uh, connect with the previous episode, uh, with the Alan Watts statement. So... Spirituality, not religion. Spirituality, although religious lowercase r is, means a practice, right? A real expression of spirituality. Um, spirituality and art are older than taxes, than laws, than words, than any ideology because we started doing them before we had words. I'm proposing... This is an extension of her language in my reasoning based on other fascinating research. Actually, for anybody who wants a quick look, his stuff is hard to find. But Stan Tenen, interesting, quirky um, gentleman who was a non-practicing uh, Jew. He didn't – and I know there's a lot of uh, controversy right now and a lot of things that people will say about uh, – Jewish sources. This guy was non-practicing. This guy was like a Woody Allen. Okay, he didn't care about the religion. He did not care about the religion. But then he f he read something and figured saw something and figured something out and unpacked something from that uh, from the words in Genesis uh, that radically changed his mind and started to honor the religion. Although, so he doesn't practice it still because it's better. It's this this thing is deeper and older than the religion that is practiced now. No offense to my observant Jew friends. I got friends in every corner, folks. And that's sort of part of my message. Like, we've got to stop dividing ourselves amongst these divi imaginary divisions. Um, okay. Digressing. The importance of art and, and spirituality coming up in, together is that I think one, a word that could be considered missing here is magic. When you combine spirituality and art, you get magic. And that's a theme for a broader episode, but it's important and I wanted to call it out. Okay, I want to finish this highlighted section that was like the core of the episode. And I got 16 minutes left. This is going to be a long episode. Um, although I promise shorter episodes. See if I can wrap it up in under 20. Oh no, that already, already blew that. Okay, I digress. This was not simply because they wanted to appropriate powerful forces, the people who invented, you know, our animal ancestors who invented spirituality. These early faiths, according to her research, expressed the wonder and mystery, the wonder and mystery, that seem always to have been an essential component of the human experience of this beautiful yet terrifying world. You'll note that one of the most ignored crises, however you pronounce that word, um, of our day is that there's no mystery, there's no awe, there's no wonder in our society. We've supplanted that with entertainment, which is way less healthy than awe and wonder and magic. Okay. Um... Religion, like art, she continues, like art, religion has been an attempt to find meaning and value in life. Despite the suffering that flesh is heir to. That is what art is supposed to be. And we've, we've sort of sullied art and made it a business that is no longer art, is more entertainment for business sake. As, I think... Um, the host of The Frame was talking about earlier today. Uh, a coincidence that I, we come to the same sort of thing. He said something, I can't remember his name right now, bless it, but everyone knows who he is, and I'm not, I don't mean to disrespect him. I just am not great with names, especially interesting, funky, exotic names, and his is kind of weird, I think. Whatever. My point is, 
he was he said a line that was he said a sentence that was like movies are an art that are more business than art or something like that and there's there's synergy here um art and spirituality are an attempt to find meaning in life what's the simp- what is the most common malady <coughs> excuse me what is the most common cause of stress and anxiety and pain and suffering in people today a lack of sense of meaning an inability to grasp like where does the meaning come from Like any other, she continues, like any other human activity, religion can be abused. But it seems to have been something that we always, and it's, but it seems to have been something that we always done. Interesting phrasing. Must be uh, English. Um, It was not tracked. It was not tacked onto a primordially secular nature by manipulative kings and priests but was natural to humanity. Let me interject here. The most direct criticism that could be made of all religions right now is that they are one of the tools of society's oppressors. They are an ideology. Ideology is mental slavery. They are a revenue stream. And I'm sure some of my listeners, some of you listeners, not my listeners, some of you listeners are well enough aware of all the different flavors of conspiracy theory. Let's not go down that rabbit hole now. Let's stick to what she's talking about. So it, re- religion, or rather spirituality, I, I would imagine is what she's actually referring to. It was not tacked on to a pri- primordially secular nature. So we, when we were early in our humanness, our transition from a more brutish animal state to a more self-aware state. This spirituality was happening. And what the, what the manipulative kings and priests did was hijack the consensus practices and reduce them to ideological constructs, therefore enslaving us and abusing us with them. Indeed, our cur- she continues uh, in her introduction, indeed, our current secularism is an entirely new experiment, unprecedented in human history. We will have to see how it will work. It is also true to say that our Western liberal humanism is not something that comes naturally to us. Like an appreciation of art or poetry, it has to be cultivated. Humanism is itself a religion without God. Not all religions, of course, are theistic. Our ethical, secular ideal has its own disciplines in mind and heart and gives people means of finding faith in the ultimate meaning of human life that were once provided by the more conventional religions. That's an important statement right there. What she basically said was, once you figured out that you could turn real spirituality into ideology and therefore a a capital R religion uh, and not a a religion that's whatever it was inspired by, it no longer genuinely provides that direct communion but rather controls the way you think, then you can turn anything into a religion. Full circle here, that happened to atheism. Atheism was initially, by its founding fathers, they were the people who who were first called atheists by the religious institution oppressors at the time because religion was already corrupt. That's what the atheists were doing. They were calling out the corruption. <clears throat> who else called out corruption in in their religion of their day? Oh, Jesus did, Buddha did, Muhammad did, Abraham did. Uh, I'm pretty sure Krishna did. Uh, maybe he didn't. I'm not sure, but I think that. There's a theme here. Let me wrap it up. We got 10 minutes left for this double wide edition of unauthorized and explicit readings.
a, I always say this to people because I know they haven't and I know they probably won't, but it's there to tickle their mind and go, huh, what does he mean by that? A really deep and honest look at the totality of human history will bear out that there's a lot of misconceptions floating around right now being passed off as fact um, that are meant to divide and conquer us. And one of these is that um, the, the, whenever you find reason to fight with your neighbor or your family member, then that dividing line is probably an ancient psyop of divide and conquer with the us versus them dynamic vis-a-vis vis a, vis a, an ideological polemic that is unsolvable or a, you know, a, a, a false dichotomy of ideological constructs. Like, you must have blind faith in this God or there is no God. Those are both false. You know how I know? When I've done my own personal research and experimentation, it has become pretty clear that the real thing that is that which we call God has zero need of requiring us to believe in anything. Here's why. You can always tell a charlatan from a genuine spokesperson for the divine. Very simple. A charlatan, a profiteer, a, a person out on an ego trip to become the lord of other people will say, I am God, or God has spoken to me. Singular, not all of us, plural, and I, you must listen to my words. That's a load of horseshit. And here's how the, the truth, that's the bullshit of religion. And here's the truth of a real spirituality. It is misleading to say we are all God, although it's technically more true than any one person saying they are God. Um, it's still incorrect. The true way of stating it is God is us. God is you. Not you are God. You are your ego construct. Unless you're a hardcore meditator and you're more advanced in place than I am, I mean no disrespect for anybody who is or is, uh, or has at least begun their spiritual path to un you know, understand this intellectually. I'm not trying to offend anybody that's already, you know, who might be listening in who's already on the path. I'm speaking out those who are like, what, what is all this mysticism shit? And this guy seems to explain it in an interesting way. Okay, so if you've ever wondered what, what it means to when, when, the mystics or a, a, a spiritual guru or whatever talks about, you know, God being within. It's that God is the puppeteer. God is the actor playing your part. You are the words on the page. You are the name with the colon and the sentence being written. It feels like you are that so realistically that it's easy for you to believe that God is not you. But that's the first lie. That's the first lie we told ourselves. That's the original sin, my friends. The original sin is used really incorrectly to, to brainwash people into feeling guilty and to, into buying into a blind faith contract with a system that is there to uh, control your mind and take your money and tell you what to think and how to vote and who to go kill. If your religion is doing that, it's not real spirituality. And lots of religions don't appear to be doing that, but are so deep, inculcated, and participating in that that it's just you just gotta dig a little deep. If it's got a if it's a capital R religion, if it's got a massive stadium, if a guy sits on a gold throne. And, and while they might feed 100 people a, day, a, a year or 1,000 people a year, if they aren't feeding everybody who's hungry every day uh, and getting and, – and if you aren't part of that effort, if you just go to church and sit in a pew and hand them your five bucks or your one buck every Sunday, then that's not true spirituality. That's someone talking to you about what spirituality is supposed to be inaccurately. 
neither knowingly or unwittingly, spreading lies to you. Because God is you. God is this pencil that I'm holding. God is the cosmos. God is everything. So I, you'll never catch me saying that I am God, not in the sense that like, people should worship me and blah, blah, blah. And no one should. Jesus didn't say, come worship me. He said, come be my beloved, not come blind faith believe me. And with that, we've got four minutes and 20 seconds left. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you've got questions, there's a centralized email for all the podcast segments to make it easy to get your questions on the air. That's the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo, no period, at gmail.com. Can't spell incorrigible? It's okay. I've double-checked the spelling, and it's on all my social media. You can always, you're always welcome to follow me on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. I almost never open Twitter except to clear out all those annoying uh, uh, numbers in my little fucking phone. I, I, I don't use Twitter. I don't know why. Forgive me. I, it's because it's one too many, uh, to be honest. If you really appreciate what I do and you want to participate, don't be shy. I'm looking for people to ha have this conversation with. Uh, that's especially uh, a, a shout out to local people. I'm going to vet you first. I take no shit. But if you're local, if you're down, if you're genuinely spiritual, we need to have an email conversation and a Skype meeting and a, and a, you know, and a coffee date. Um, and I mean that in a non-relationship, like totally secular kind of coffee meeting. I just don't, whatever. You know what I'm saying. Uh, if you're somewhere else in the world and you've got a little disposable income and you love what I do, I hate to beg for money after having castigated and chastised the profiteers. I'm not a profiteer. Um, I don't need this money. I've got a lovely day job that I absolutely love. I would love to do this full time and create jobs though. So uh, that's why I uh, try to, not too heavy handedly, I hope. I'm relatively new at this. So if I'm overdoing it on the self promotion, you know, give me give me a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more, and I'll uh, I'll try to tone it down. But it's also my passion and my life's calling to unravel the mysteries of this bullshit clusterfuck that's going on and help point seekers who have chosen to be seekers in the right direction. Not because I'm some authority. I'm not. Uh, for those wondering, I have never and never will claim to be awakened or enlightened. I think it's cute and adorable that people are uh, patting themselves on the back for being awakened. No offense. This is just some, uh, like, crazy old uncle. You know, I'm the crazy old uncle that knows a shit ton more than you out of your family. And um, nobody's awake yet. You know who's awake? Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Mary, uh, and a bunch of other people whose names we've forgotten. There are people who wake up, and they go on to go do stuff. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's not possible. I'm just saying that anybody who's on Facebook patting themselves on the back for being awake ain't. All the enlightened ones are busy on another plane, in another dimension. They got nothing to do with Facebook, folks. So, you know, that's self-evident. I'm not enlightened yet. But here's the kicker. I've done enough research. I'm convinced at a not, I don't believe this. I think I know it is real. Phenomenologically, I've had enough evidence. And research-wise, I've had enough Co, uh, what's how do you pronounce that word? Co not collaboration, but corroboration of that evidence from other people's very believable evidence, giving witnessing testimony that the transcendental bullshit is real. That all that hippie new age woo woo is where you can start having that direct personal relationship instead of believing in somebody else's word model of it, and that that will heal you. I gotta go. A peace, love, and grooviness be with you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for liking. Thanks for subscribing. Uh, all that. Peace out. <laughs>